Welcome to the Move Podcast. And as you can see, we've got a little bit of a different shake up here. But today, George Hincampy and myself, J.B. Hager, are going to tell you about the 110th edition of Milan San Remo. First, we should probably address why, you know, Lance is not here. And, and for good reason. It's uh, spring break this time of year for a lot of people and families take off and get a little vacation time. And when you have five children. Yep. <laughs> that kind of is I, important. I'm still kind of in shock that Lance gave us the keys to the kingdom. I've I know. Been 30 years, and uh, he's never put this much faith and confidence in me. So <laughs> I'm still kind of trying to absorb all of that. But uh, thank you, Lance, for uh, putting us in charge here of Milan San Remo. Well, and as, as we learned last year with a lot of the coverage you did with us during the tour and some of the classics, you tend to be right more <laughs> often. Again, he did it again today, so we'll get to that in a bit. But I do, I do want to address, we're, we're here at George's Place uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, which is beautiful, by the way. Um, this has become a bit of a cycling mecca, has it not? Yeah, I moved here, what, what are we, we're, over 20 years ago, I moved here just because of the cycling. I mean, I came here to visit some friends, visited my brother, and... The riding around here in the upstate of South Carolina is truly world class. Uh, and now I love it for so many other reasons. It's a great place to raise a family. Um, but I really encourage people who have not been here and are really into cycling to come check out uh, these incredible roads that we have. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, we always talk uh, when we're doing the, the tour coverage, especially about how, oh, it's nice, George. Oh, George is just Mr. <laughs> nice Guy all the time. And then Lance gets pigeonholed as a curmudgeon. <laughs> I will tell you this, staying at his home, Bolch and I coming out here to handle this, just as nice as can be, as <laughs> hospitable. And add on top of it, your wife, yeah. who's a darling and very hospitable as well. Yeah. Uh, and super sweet. And his kids are super sweet. <laughs> you might see them running around here in a minute. I mean, just so polite. Oh, and thank you. I'm going to add to I'm going to keep going. His dogs are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Two very adorable now dogs. You're gonna, now you're going to make Lance really mad at us. <laughs> you, know, you know, here's what's going to make him mad. George has something in particular at his house that uh, Bolch and I were geeking out on a little bit. Uh-oh. He has sparkling water on tap. <laughs> Oh, I yeah. have Very, never in my life seen that in somebody's oh, I love residence. It. Very simple deal. But think about all like the Perrier's. When I'm at Lance's house, we go through like, I don't know, cases of Perrier a day. So this is a much easier uh, way to drink sparkling water. Didn't even know that was an option. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't even know what it's called, but it's a uh, very, very... Uh, Good convenience to have in the house. Do you bathe in it? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, as I said, this was the 110th edition of this race. Milan San Remo, the longest of the season. And it's just, it's ridiculous. 291 kilometers is what nope. they covered today, which is about 181 miles. Don't forget about, it's 10 kilometers. So attack on another six miles to get out of Milan Oh, they before they even Milan really at nine drop o'clock. the flag. Yeah, and you ride through the town. It's Jeez. probably a 20 minute ride through the town because you got to cross over these, all these train tracks, um, the cobblestones. It's usually really cold. So that's another, you know, 10, 10K. So it ends up being, um, and usually at the finish, you got to ride like three, or three to 5K to the hotel to shower. So it ends up being over 300 kilometers. It's the longest that's by far crazy. of the year. And, you know, I went back and listened to the coverage last year. We, weren't, we didn't have you on that one. And Lance mm -hmm. and I talked quite a bit about the nutrition difference. And you've done Milan San Remo 17 times. Yeah. So you know this course. And what's the difference in preparation just because of the distance? Well, so San Remo, a lot of guys, uh, the, the favorites are usually doing Paris Nice or uh, Terreno Adriatico. And as you saw today, uh, the favorite did Terreno. And sometimes they choose that because it's typically usually better weather in, uh, in Italy um, during that time of the year. Um, the stages are longer. And then you don't have that one week break in between uh, Paris Nice to San Remo. Uh, so they, they'll, they'll have, I think they have three or four days off after the end of Terreno where you, you're not really training. Occasionally, usually about stage six, five or six in Terreno, it's a really long stage. It's, about, it's usually about 240 kilometers. And the, the organizers do it, I guess, just to help people get used to the distance. But you'll see some of the guys riding back to the hotel or you know throwing in another 50K to try to mimic the distance of a San Remo, um, 
which I had done in the past, but I don't think it's very necessary. Uh, see, At that that's point, hard it's about fathom. racing. It really is. At you that go point, out and you just raced your yeah, guts and Torino out. this year was amazing, like very, very difficult. So I would be surprised if some of the guys were doing that. But you would see uh, back in my day, like Bonin and all these guys behind the motor after the race, getting in another 30, 40 K going to the hotel. Well, what was your choice? There's a couple of options like doing that race or doing Perry knees to yeah. get the week of racing in your legs. Did, did you try both? I did both. I probably, so I did uh, San Remo 17 times and I would say probably 50% of the time I did Perry knees. The other 50% was uh, Torino. Later in my career, my, later on in my career, I usually just focus on Torino because we had a, uh, like Oroica before, uh, which was a really kind of fun race um, on ground. Well, racing is not fun at that level. It's it's hard, but it's a great preparation race, and it was usually uh, a good way to get get your find your form or see where you were at. And then from there, you go straight to Torino, um, and then from Torino, you go basically straight to Milan or close to it. You only have three days to recover and get ready for the race. It was funny when I asked George earlier this morning. I go, well, what was your best result? And you couldn't even remember. <laughs> You had to call your brother. I, I, I did. I had to call my brother. I mean, 17 <laughs> times, they all kind of just gelled together. My, I know my most fond memory, it was 2009 when uh, I was in uh, on, on HTC, uh, and uh, we had Cavendish on the team, and we were all super focused on the result. Nobody th could... Nobody would have guessed that Cavendish could make it over the Pojo. In fact, I wasn't even really that sure he was going to make it. And I remember very clearly on the top of the Pojo, it was the only time in my 17-year career that... Um, I went down the Pojo with the brakes on because I was at the front of the group and he was at the back of the group. And it was probably about 40, 50 guys left in the group. So I'm on going down the Pojo, brakes on, the director's yelling at me, telling me he's still in the group, he's still in the group. And at the time, if Cavendish was in the group, it was a very, very high chance of him winning. Uh, so sure enough, we connected at the bottom of the, uh, the Pojo descent. And from there, you only have two and a half kilometers. And I just kind of hauled ass down the side of the, side of the peloton, got him to the front. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, who was the Australian guy that launched? Hausler. Hausler launched with about 400 meters to go, a very long sprint, and he got a major gap. And uh, that's I was done at that point. I pulled off, and Cavendish kind of seeked him in like a, like a missile and uh, beat him by half a centimeter. I got an interesting stat I saw. This, this was actually on Cycling News this morning. This, this was in 09, the race you're talking about. Yeah. It's just kind of random that the race is 11 million seven hundred thirty four or seven hundred thirty four thousand two hundred seventy two inches long. <laughs> Cavendish won by half of one of those inches. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I recommend pulling up that video because it was it was probably I mean, it's one of my favorite uh, memories of cycling. Just the fact that he won that um, and, the, and the way he won it uh, was super exciting. So that was your fondest memory, worst memory. Worst memory. Ooh. I don't think I don't remember having any bad crashes in San Remo, but definitely the early years when uh, you get, you know, the, no matter how much you train, I, the, this theory is not not really relevant to today because Al Philippe is so young. But it takes time to kind of build up that sort of endurance. I mean, 300 kilometers is a whole different sort of system in your body, and I didn't really get used to that distance until later on in my career, the last five, ten years of my career. Um, but San Remo is, is, is a funny race where you go through different stages. You'll do the first goal, goal is the Turquino, which is about um, 80 miles in, and it's about a, a 10 mile climb. It's a legit climb, and it's a hard effort. Nothing ever happens on that climb because you go down the coast and then you have another 100 miles to go. Um, but that's kind of mentally, you look at getting over that climb. You feel good on that climb. You think, okay, I'm going to have a good day. And usually for me, I'd go through another stage where I go, shit, I'm bonking. Like mm -hmm. 120 miles and you go, I need to eat some food or otherwise I'm not going to make it. And you kind of start questioning where you're at. And then with 30K to go, when you're getting close to the suppressor and all the action starts happening, as you saw today on TV, it's windy, it's stressful. There's cars parked on the side of the road. There's people jumping in trying to take photographs. It gets so chaotic that many times you kind of forget that you're on the verge of bonking and you just get into that race mode and, and your, 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 uh, your ment mentality takes over where you're just thinking about the finish line. Um, and all that stress and all that chaos kind of many times fed me to like motivate to get to the front and, and obviously position is so important in that race. Uh, it's hard to describe, you know, going through those really narrow paths through the towns, 
um, how chaotic it really is. I know you pointed out something interesting to me that I don't think we talked about last year. This race compared to most, they don't move the cars off the street. Yep, they don't move the cars. You saw, if you watch, they're parked all over the sides of the roads. And they're not And they're narrow roads on top of it. There's narrow, narrow roads sections. and not consistent where you're, you have the whole road and then all of a sudden you don't have the whole road and there's cars parked on either side. It makes no sense to me, but it's been like that for probably a, a, a hundred years. <laughs> and not to mention, as you're looking at those string of cars parked on the side of the road, there's, there's people popping out between them. Yep. And then you're like, do they have a dog with them or is their kid going to dart out there? Yep. And everybody stressful. knows that. All the riders know it. So the, all the directors are yelling at them to be at the front, stay in position. So it's not like you can sit at the back. Although today, Philippe was at the back uh, about 5, 6K before the Suppressa, which to me was shocking. I mean, he must have been on just one of those days where he could do no wrong. You know, we did see something interesting that you brought up and I want to ask you about it. There was a breakaway that... I don't, I don't know that anyone felt like it was going to stay away. That's really difficult when everybody's moving at 50 K an hour, mm -hmm. but there were, there were four teammates out of what, seven or eight, yep. uh, from Norvo notice. Like, yeah, I mean, that, uh, to me, that's a great job. The breakaway, I would say half the teams in the race, their only job in the whole race, even if it's not to finish the race is to make the breakaway. So it's very tough. The first, I don't know how long it took today to get in the breakaway, but it's not an easy task. And uh, for them to have four guys, Novo Nordis, it's a team based out of basically here in Atlanta, down the road, Phil Sutherland, a uh, good friend of mine. He's got to be happy with his, his team showing showing the colors on TV all day long. But even in like the that number, say seven to ten riders in a break, that's like the perfect number, right? Yeah, yeah. And they still can't. That just is a testament to the speed of this race. Like, oh, yeah. It's, it's, in a lot of races, that's like they're gone. They got four guys yep, in the break. Yeah. Yeah, you don't. You wouldn't see that in that many races. But in San Remo, the chances of the breakaway staying away on the coast, uh, even if it's a big breakaway, are very, very slim. I think it's only happened, you know, I would say under 10 times in the 110-year history. And you have to help it wander, you know, the contenders, which there were a lot. Mm -hmm. First, we'll talk about how they conserve, and then we'll talk sprinting versus the getaway guy, the climbing guys. But you just have to be thinking for six plus hours, conserve, 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 because you just have to have that either a punch to get away or a sprint. Yeah. Like you cannot do any work, but yet it's moving super fast. Yeah. Is that I all mean, they're thinking you, about is save myself? Yeah. The one, the one yeah. special thing about um, San Remo is it's so fast, but you also get, so if you're in the middle of the group, many times you're just getting sucked along. Now you can't stay there during the, the stressful sections where it's getting very narrow, but for the most part, you can sit in the middle group and save as much energy as possible. And, and if you're one of the leaders, you usually have one or two or three of your teammates around you in case something were to happen. Um, but you, it's like, you, I don't know if everybody's, if you've read in the press, but San Remo is probably one of the hardest races to win, but one of the easiest races to finish because of the fact that you just get sucked along in the Peloton. You know, um, there's two types of riders that can win this race. And, and, uh, and George explained to me that it's like a 50, 50 shot. If it's someone that's got a punchy kick uphill or a sprinters race, mm. And it splits over time, you know, yeah. whether it goes down with a break at one of the last two climbs or a sprint. Yeah. You think it would, I mean, there are very few races like that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, most of the races, there's just so many other variables uh, to the end result. But San Remo is usually very predictable. And, it, and a lot has to do with the way the wind is blowing on the climb, whether or not a sprinter is going to make it over. Um, but, I mean, let's go back. It's not... A sprinter, sprinters can win the race, and they have in the past, but you still got to get up that those hills. And even though they're not very steep, if you rode those hills in training, you think, oh, no big deal, I can ride in a big chain ring. After 130 miles, 40 miles, after 150 miles, climbing those hills is a big difference. So those sprinters like Cav and those guys that made it, they, can, they still were able to climb that mountain and stay in the, and stay in the group, albeit you know, right at the back of the group, headwind probably, but... It's uh, they still got to get get up those hills. Yeah, I mean, uh, describe those last two climbs, the Suppressa and Poggio, to everybody because even Lance last year said they're not as big as you think. Yeah, it's just the fact that you've got so many miles in your legs. Yeah, it, so it many probably miles feels that way. 
It's the fact you have so many miles in there. Like I said, if you do, if you do a recon and train and ride, you think it's, it's only five. It's like four or five percent average. It's not very steep, but they go the distance and the and the speed they come into it and the and the and the, and the amount of energy they use just to enter those climbs in the first twenty riders is massive. It's a, so it's a, it adds to the, how difficult those climbs can be at the end of that race. It was really pretty entertaining. We were at, uh, George's brother's home and he's got this downstairs home theater type mm-hmm. room. And there were, uh, several pros, former yep. pros down there, several guys. <laughs> and so sitting in that theater setting with all of you guys that have ridden that course yeah. and know how hairy it is on uh, some of the descents in, yeah. be- in between the climbs, you guys were all jumping out of your chairs, <laughs> like, cause you know exactly what that felt like. Oh, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, we had Christian Vanderbilt down there, Bobby Julik. Um, and then a lot of, they did, a, they, they all did it probably, at least probably five, 10 times. And Bobby lived really close to there. So we all know those roads really well. And, we know the risks the riders are taking, and we're all very happy to not be taking those risks and watching it on TV. Yeah, we were watching a, a guy that tried to break away earlier, and I think I got his name right, Bonifacio. Yeah. And I looked up, like, that's his home roads. He's yeah. from there. And so... Yeah, you mentioned that to me. I didn't know that, but he went down that hill. I'd love to, like, see his Strava or whatever going down that hill. He probably went down faster than... Than it's ever been than done. Ever, ever done. I mean, maybe Cab or Cipollini have gone that fast, but I can't imagine that many. And others. what's really hairy when you were watching him descent and taking these huge risks, these hairpins on a descent with a retaining wall on the other side, um, passing the moto. Like the, yeah. the motos can literally not go as fast as the bike, mm-hmm. and they they well, kind of they get a little bit of it. Advantage for bl- these fleeting moments. Does that really make a difference oh, when they absolutely. get behind the moto? Absolutely. You know how many races I got like I lost a podium spot or missed a breakaway because of uh, a hometown rider getting a little moto love. It happens all the time. Whenever you see the rider close up in the camera, he's getting moto love. And whether it's on purpose by the motorcycle driver or not, um, they're they're going to take advantage of it. Yeah, the, I mean, the motorcycles are clearly doing what they can do to yeah, stay out of the way. Sometimes they just can't get out of the way. And then they just have to let them pass. Yeah, exactly. And that did happen today, yep. which was pretty wild. He's going to be a hero in his little town, though, for sure. Just he, for that break. That was a ballsy move. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. That was very, very cool. Now let's get to the finale, which was incredibly exciting. Yep. There were several guys who could win, but of course, George picked the winner. <laughs> I had picked the winner a couple of days ago just because of watching Ali Philippe in Torino, how strong he was, can win uphill, can win a field sprint. Um, you know, he was on just major form and uh, that was my pick for the day and I'm happy I got it right again. I know. What, and he's having a heck of an early spring season. He like is. what is, and he's a younger guy, right? Yep, yep. What is this guy doing? What is it about him? <laughs> I mean, he's definitely on some incredible form right now. Um, I, and I don't see him slowing down anytime soon. These guys, they have it all planned out. He's going to have, I'm sure he'll have a, a bit of a rest before his next goals. He's probably going to get ready for uh, Liege and Amstel in those races. My guess is he's not going to do Flanders and all the Belgium stuff. Um, so I would guess he's going to take a little bit of time off, recover, and then get ready for Flesh and Liege in, in those races. Yeah, and that was my next question, I think. You talk about him taking a break because he was on form early. Like, you, you can't maintain that that no. long. There, I mean, it, it peaks and valleys, yeah. right? You have to let the body recover. Yeah, you gotta let the, and or you're, you're going to end up sick and destroy a season, exactly. right? Exactly. And he's obviously, he's got, he's on top form right now. And all he can do right now is recover. I'd be, I haven't looked at his post San Remo schedule. I'd be surprised if they sent him to Catalonia, which starts on Monday. So a lot of these guys, like Valverde is probably on his way back to Spain right now, has a day off and then starts a seven-day stage race in, in Spain. So that's a, that's a tough schedule. I would be surprised if they sent Philippe there. And one of the people really contesting Philippe was uh, Peter Sagan, who's one of, if not the most loved guy in the Peloton right now. I mean, <laughs> right? Don't you think? People love this guy. In the Peloton? Or I in mean, the in the, I'm would, sorry, would, in the yeah, fan base. In the fan base, yeah. I don't know if so much in the Peloton. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, that's what I meant. Yeah. And it's funny. I could tell when you looked, I, I, I was wording that wrong. Yeah. yeah, the fans seem to love him because he's a, he's a dynamic oh, personality. Yeah. I mean, huge personality. He's done a lot of things for the sport. Has been sick for a good part of the spring, and his, you can see how he's bounced back. Started coming up, getting seconds and thirds in terrain. Know, 
today. Was he third or fourth? I don't I, Yeah, I mean, he, he was, was right there, but he was in there at the finish. So I, my guess with the way he's recovered from his illness, he is going to be killing it at Flanders. I mean, that that's mind boggling to me. They go, okay, I'm sick early season. I'm going to race through it. Yeah. I'm racing through sickness. Explain that. <laughs> Well, it seems like it's very counterintuitive. Yeah, right? I mean, somebody that good, uh, you know, he's got he's got nutritionists, he's got doctors, everybody just kind of watching him through. My guess is he he tried to take it as easy as possible in the race, like not trying to make the front group until he started feeling better, and then you can see he's starting to get in the sprints, starting to make the front groups, and then he's close to top form at San Remo. So we can probably see him from what we saw today coming out of this illness and looking good. I think so. I think he's made a big, big recovery and he's going to be, he's going to be right on top form for Flanders. My, okay. my one year I had a, I had a really good Torino and I'll never forget. My wife came and surprised me at Torino. They drove like nine hours to, uh, uh, Chestnut to go in Italy and brought my, my daughter. She was like, I don't know, six months old at the time. And I was on really good form. So I thought it'd be super good for, for San Remo. And then the class is coming up. And the night before San Remo, I was like, oh, I'm not feeling good. Got like a really bad uh, flu or virus. And I was wiped out. I couldn't even start the race. And this is three weeks before my biggest goal of the year, Paris-Roubaix. Mm-hmm. So this was 2006. And I was just, you know, devastated not being able to start. I was that sick when you're just feverish. You know, you have the, the getting on the bike is the last thing you can do. So I drove home. Um, and just with, for the next 10 days, I was basically in and out of the bed, wasn't able to ride. After 10 days, I went for like an hour and a half ride. And uh, I remember, I was thinking, you know what, I feel, I feel at least I'm able to pedal. So I'm like, I'm going to go up to Belgium and do Robin Sapel and try to do these early sur- sort of semi-classics just to try to get race fit again. Because I'm, I'm not sick anymore. I, got, I feel terrible. But then I, I, I just... Bounced back. I got top 10 in the first race, and then I felt really good at Flanders. And then I got, uh, that year I got second place in Roubaix. So it's like one of my best Roubaix's ever after being like super, super sick, sick three weeks before that. So your body just kind of yeah. bounces back pretty good. You know what was kind of mind boggling to me is how many races there are. And, you know, growing up watching racing and being a fan of the sport, we only got so much that we could view in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the game has changed with all these streaming channels and things like that. And there was a time where you could go rent the video of it months later, yeah, right? Yeah. It, was, it was really hard to watch. So growing up, enjoying watching European cycling as an American, had no idea how many races there are that we've never heard of. Oh, yeah. I was showing George a calendar this morning. I go... Look, look at all these races you can see streaming now. And mm-hmm. it was mind blowing. So th- to your point, if, if you're coming back from an illness, a little off form, you can kind of sneak away from the mainstream and go get it back doing a lot of these other smaller Absolutely. races. Can't and you? All, all the teams will, will, you know, someone likes to go and get sick. They'll go, okay, well, let's, let's, kind of, you know, let's wait till he gets better. And instead of, you know, send them to a set schedule, maybe send them to some easier races, try to get the race legs back. But at this time of the year, there's so many different options to uh, get your race fitness back. Who else stood out at you today as we're, you know, hitting the first of the monuments, going into the ones that, that you also know so well? Uh, who is getting your attention that we can keep an eye um, on the next month? Yeah, Valverde looked really good. I mean, that's not his type of race. I mean, he needs a much steeper climb to form, but he was right there with the top guys. Um, Trentini was uh, was incredible. I think he's going to be a bit disappointed. He he took a big chance by trying to get away on that downhill. Used up a lot of his energy, um, but showed some great fitness. I think he'll be he'll be one of the favorites there in Flanders. Uh, Van Art, you know, coming from the cyclocross world, right there in the group of what six, seven guys of the best guys in the world with very little experience in that type of distance. To, for him to be there is pretty amazing. Those guys uh, definitely stood out. How many of those guys now go do cycle cross in, uh, in through the winter? To um, be? I don't not think very, they, Not much not, overlap there? No, not, not anymore. It's just too difficult to... That's uh, too much to sustain, yeah, isn't it? too much to sustain. Wow. Okay. Well... You know, now we are looking into the ones that that uh, you love, and you're going to be 
Well, you love that one too, but the ones we're going to cover coming up, we have Flanders on the horizon yep. on the seventh, and you're going to join us for that show. New well, no, I won't be joining you. For, I'll be at Flanders. You're going to be at I'll be Flanders. Sending you guys That's right. I'll be Maybe we'll you get guys. you on the phone. Yeah. And then we're coming back to cover Roubaix. Roubaix, here coming back to cover Roubaix. And what, next weekend we're doing sort of a, uh, classic sort of preview as well out in Fort Worth at our Grand Fundo in Fort Worth. And that's the first time to do that, right? Yeah, that's the first time we've done that. Yep. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be a classics preview of what's ahead of us and yep. dig really deep and probably go deeper into some predictions and those type of things, right? Yep. Of yep, who you think's sure. on form right now. Very cool. By next week, we'll have uh, what happened in Catalonia as well, which will be a good indication of who's going to be good in the, you know, the Haley classics like Liege, Flesh, and Amstel Gold. Um, so we'll be able to have some insight who's got some form there. And there's some, there's some like midweek, uh, Belgian races as well that we'll be able to see the guys, some of the guys that might not have done so well in San Remo, but are now, are now starting to build up for the, you know, the Northern classics. We'll, we'll see some shout, some standouts there as well. Well, cool. Thanks for having you, having all of us here to your home My and pleasure. being so hospitable in the, uh, sparkling water sponge <laughs> bath. Exactly. was really special. <laughs> uh, no, we really appreciate it. And thanks for joining the move. And uh, thank you to Patron Tequila for continuing to sponsor this program. We appreciate it. We haven't dug Absolutely. into the Lanceritas because we don't have his secret recipe, really. I know. He won't share it. But uh, ne next next weekend, he'll be there with us. So maybe we can have a couple of Lanceritas on the show. Cool. And if you have any questions you want for George going into to especially that maybe we can address them during this uh, classics preview and yep. that we're going to do in Fort Worth. Send those to us now, the move at we do team. <laughs>